thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> this is amazing. Um, I've been to a lot of events over a lot of years. Um, I've been to a lot of women's events, mostly through the Women's Sports Foundation. I think this is the first real women's event that I've ever been to at a motorsports, at a race. Uh, we've done them at race venues. I mean, we've done them in Indianapolis, we've done them, uh, but we've never been connected to an actual race happening. And so uh, I really want to thank Matt Cruz again um, for putting, help, really inviting us to put this together. Um, you all know I've been in this sport for a long time. And the, the most important part of this, by the way, that I feel is that not only do we have a lot of women in the room, and this is a powerful audience, is we have a lot of men that have joined us as well. Um, so this, it can't just be about women, it has to be about women for women, and, and this is a much bigger picture, and it takes men you know, to, to be a part of this. Um, change is hard. You know, and this is what we're really asking for. We're asking for, for change. We're asking for an industry to change. We're asking for a sport to change. We're asking for business to change. And change is hard and change comes slow. Damn it, that's the hard part is it comes slow. Because we're talking about the future, this is diversity and, and, and driving for the future, um, you know, I've worked a long time with our driver development program and, and, and when I did India 92, um, it was unbelievable that I got so much fan mail. I'd never gotten that kind of fan mail before. And it was people asking for advice. It wasn't just asking for an autograph. And, and I created this driver development program that brought young drivers, I thought young drivers, and most of the drivers, and this was in the 90s, were like in their 20s and 30s and even older. I had one driver in my very first driver development program, um, and she was 16. And I remember her telling us all that she was going to be, now this was right after I had only done Indy once, and I was coming back again, that she said, I'm going to be the first woman to win the Indy 500. And I'm like, wait a minute, I'm sitting in the audience. This kid has just decided to discard me, and even though this is my program, you know. But it was, it was an eye-opener, it was enlightening, because I realized that we had young people that really had these aspirations. But most of them were in their 20s and 30s, as I said. As the years evolved, they kept getting younger and younger and younger. And so it is very exciting, because now we have really a hard, long, large crop of young females um, that are competing in the sport, that have maybe aspirations just to continue competing in the sport, but they also want to be able to have you know, a career, maybe a future. Um, so I, I'm hopeful about the future. And um, one of the things I learned from Billie Jean King was if you don't know your past and your history, you don't have a future. So a lot of this I have learned is to, to study the past as well um, because we do want to have a future. So and everything I want you to all think about today, the whole day, is that every one of us, every one of you have had a different journey. And we can all learn from each other. We, you know, just because we're... We, I hate being categorized. You're a woman in racing, so that means we're like everybody, we're all like every other woman, or if you're a Hispanic, or if you're a person of color. You know, we all have a very unique, different journey, and that's what we're here today, is to share those journeys with you, and hopefully you with us, um, and, and, you know, be able to learn and be able to help make that change happen, hopefully a little quicker. Um, as far as the structure, I'm not, we're not going to have time to do Q&A, um, but hopefully at lunch you'll have an opportunity to, you know, to interact with everybody up here and, and do questions. So um, I want to really focus it right now on our panelists and, and, and asking them questions. I'm going to start with Dr. Clegg, who of course is our you know, wonderful beneficiary in what you've done. Uh, what is your background and what motivated you to take on this incredible challenge to create a not-for-profit and, uh, and make a difference for these young females? One good morning. Is this working or do I need to hit? Everybody? Just hold it close, I think. Okay. Yeah. Everybody can hear me? I project pretty well. Um, one, I grew up on a dirt road in Mississippi, uh, North Mississippi, right outside of Memphis. Oxford area in Batesville, um, where as a child, and even today, um, we have a black park and a white park, believe it or not, in 2021. Yes. 
So sport was not accessible uh, for me as a child growing up. Um, and so later in life, as I acquired more education and landed uh, my career uh, at CDC, the infamous CDC, uh, that's quite disappointing right now, but we won't get political. Um, when I landed my career there, um, in, in cancer research in particular, a lot of my work uh, was focused on physical activity and the prevention of overweight and obesity, which I had struggled with all of my life up until that point in my early 20s. Uh, and I, I started some work while at CDC uh, at, the at the community and population level. Uh, engaging girls and women in physical activity and sport uh, and then went on to pursue my PhD at the University of Alabama and um, during that time was assigned a, a project to create a community-based program uh, and I chose uh, to start Play Like a Girl. Uh, I honestly had no intention for uh, this thing to uh, have life beyond a classroom project. Uh, but it actually um, grew in popularity from a very uh, organic place because one, it created a space for, a safe space for girls and women to connect, um, both the moms of girls, uh, one to one another, one to the other, and then also the mom to the girl. It created the environment um, that was necessary for them to be able to have some important conversations. Uh, and then it also, you know, created a movement in the community um, around an issue that was impacting women across Alabama at the time uh, and kind of took on a life of its own. I turned the other way, went back to Atlanta <laughs> and became a university professor at Georgia. Um, and eight years later, it was still running on the, on the shoulders and backs of women volunteers. Uh, and that speaks to each of you who are in this room. You know, you have started revolutionary things, movements, uh, and actions that um, truly impact the lives of other people, girls in particular. And that's really how Play Like a Girl came about. Um, I often say it was not in, with intention in the way that, you know, I sat down and planned it with the intention to live now 16, 17 years later. But it is the passion of my life. I love what I do, but it is not having the same opportunities as the other girls in my community that really fuel what I now do. Um, really trying to bridge the worlds of STEM and sport for the girls who most of my girls don't look like me. So I also recognize, having grown up in that small town, that uh, need doesn't have a color of skin. It doesn't have a bank account necessarily, uh, but need for women, because we are all underrepresented as women uh, in the fields of sport and STEM, uh, is a universal connection. And uh, that's really what drives us to do what we do at Play Like a Girl. So, yeah. How do you connect the sports with the STEM? Yeah, so that is a question that is often asked. Why play? Um, well, one, uh, ESPNW is one of our big time friends. We love ESPNW and the Women's Sports Foundation, uh, who were some of our first, um, our first funders uh, after Emmett Smith, the Hall of Fame Emmett Smith at the Cowboys. Uh, he actually funded our first uh, sport program. So we transitioned from just a focus on the benefit of physical activity and sport for health uh, to connect sport and STEM in 2016 because a, re a research study, global study, of women in the C-suite conducted by Ernst & Young and ESPNW showed that 94% of women in the C-suite played sport at some point in their lives. Remember that. Yeah, Remember 94, that. 52% through college. And that was, for me, a revolutionary moment. Um, as I went back to my board and I said, you know, we haven't quite gotten it all wrong, but we've not gotten it all right. There's an opportunity, a margin of opportunity here for us to connect the work that we're doing on the sports side uh, to lifelong success for girls. And uh, we introduced uh, STEM because, again, girls and women are rep underrepresented in STEM. So in the US workforce, uh, women make up 50% of the workforce. However, in the STEM workforce, we hold less than 30% of the jobs. And in computer science and engineering, about 10%. So think about that for women of color, women with disabilities, uh, LGBTQI women. It is, you know, unreal, uh, the deficit of women. But what we know is that it is not because we lack 
aptitude. It's not because we lack, uh, you know, the true drive and interest in STEM, uh, STEM subjects. It is because we lack representation. We lack the evidence of other women through role models and mentorship uh, who can be the faces for girls. And I often say, you know, our girls, uh, like Elizabeth, who is here this morning, and hopefully we'll see some more of the girls at the Paddock Tour, girls today need to see brilliant women like yourselves doing brilliant things so that they can believe themselves to be able to do brilliant things too. That's all. And that's really what we try to create for our girls. That's awesome. So you're all role models. We're all role models. Yes, we're all role models. And I'll just add that the first sport I ever played was field hockey in seventh grade because I went to a girls school. I mean, this was before Title IX. And I've always said if I had not got on that field, I never would have had the, the maybe the courage isn't the right word, but the thought that I could get behind the wheel of a Pinto on a racetrack. So, you know, sports is important. Thank you. Uh, Sabra. Hello. Yes. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> I've known Sabra for a long time. Um, she came to my driver development program. Sabra um, has ra is a champion. You, you do have bios in there, but I still kind of want you all to know who you're listening to. Um, Sabra is a championship uh, go kart winning uh, racetrack racer. Uh, I went to some of her go kart, watched her absolutely badass kick some butt in, in go karting. Went on to run some also uh, open wheel formula cars in um, in the road to Indy cars, which is her aspiration. And now has done her second full season of the W series. And really quick, if you don't know about the W series, it is a new series that started uh, two years ago for very high level open wheel cars, very sophisticated open wheel cars um, in Europe. Is now a uh, a support race at a number of the of the actual Formula One races, and it's for all women drivers. And it was a lightning rod when it was announced because it's the first time we've really had a series for all women, and our sport is about not all women. It's, it's one of the few sports where men and women can actually compete on an equal level. But as it has turned out, it has actually turned done some real good for women in racing, and so Sabre's been competing for the second season in that. So Sabre, I want you to share with us how you got started in the sport um, and what your early experiences were like. So I was very lucky to have a father that was in motorsports. He raced motocross and supercross professionally. Um, my mother and him obviously didn't want us racing motorcycles because it's not if you crash, it's when. So we got into karting from a young age, my brother and I did. And uh, I was lucky that my dad and his brother and my grandfather actually ended up building a karting track in my hometown. And I just grew up running around there, not knowing that it was a bit odd for a young girl to, to be in that sort of setting. Um, and took off with the karting thing, just took it, started to take it very seriously when I was about 10 years old, um, went on to win three national championships, three world championships, and knew that this was what I wanted to do by the time I was 13 years old. And um, experienced lots of highs and lows, um, lots of struggles, and I was help lucky to have people like Lynn come along along the way and give me some advice that helped me keep going. And I was finally able to move to cars by the time I was almost 23 years old, better late than never, but um, finally got the sponsorship to do so. So it's uh, it's been an amazing experience, and I, just, I guess I want to share, especially the people that are here in the room that aren't used to being in motorsports, is that motorsports is such a special thing, and because I feel like it challenges you in in so many ways versus anything else in your life and it puts you in this state where you're uncomfortable and you but you just have to learn how to be okay with being uncomfortable and you have to learn how to like weaponize that so I, I just I'm so glad that you're all here and you're learning to experience motorsports for the first time so that delay of winning all those karting championships and not being in cars till 23 was because you had decided to be, go to a college and get an engineering degree. <laughs> so, so you got an engineering degree from the Colorado School of Mines, which is one of the top engineering schools in the country. Um, and then you were selected by Infinity to represent the United States um, against all other engineers. I mean, this was a competition, and they selected her to go to Europe for a year and be like an intern or shadow engineer um, for Formula One teams for a whole season while she then was also competing. So you, this delay is caused because you've got this brilliant you know, engineering degree, which is really hard to do. So um, what was that like going to Europe and you know, being a part of a Formula One, what was it like to be part of a Formula One team? <laughs> 
Um, it was an amazing experience. Um, it was everything that I kind of hoped that it would be, and then also with a, a few twists and surprises along the way. But uh, it was special because, I mean, this, this is probably going to shock most people in the room. In my department, I worked in suspension composite design. The, out of the four of us, three of us were women. So it's, it's pretty amazing, and I think it's STEM and motorsports is much more part of way of life in Europe. But there, there are women out there, there are women in the industry, but um, sadly, when I was in school, it was more like what you said, where it's like I was one in a, in a room of a hundred that was mostly, mostly male. So it, it, we are out there, and they are there, but, um, but yeah, we are definitely still the minority. So... Um you now competed for two seasons in the W Series, so could you tell us a little bit about you know, your experience with that and how you feel it's, it has made a, a difference, hopefully a positive difference for women in racing? No, the W Series honestly has saved and revived my, my career. It's given me consistency time when I had really no other option, and it's the first series I've ever had that I didn't have to bring sponsorship for. It's the first full seasons I've ever had where I didn't have to stress about, am I going to have enough money to, to make it to the next race? So for me, W Series is amazing. It's pushed its brand. It's pushed our own personal brands of each of the drivers, and it's just been like, hey, we're still here. We're still fighting, and we need these opportunities in order to move forward. So we know that money drives the sport um, and sponsorship. So. Putting that aside, because we know that, um, what do you need to make it to the next step in your career? Well, the next step, which I hope is the road to Indy, um, I would really, I, what I would need to move forward is basically just more um, people and more amazing people to join me and help me be a part of my team so that way I can build basically long-term success. So that way I can make the right choices, be put in the right opportunities along the way. Make note. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, so, to the one who did make it, <laughs> Sarah Fisher, um, what a career you have had. Um, truly amazing. You know, I know you started racing at a very young age, family, very family connected and family driven. Um, when did you decide to make? to decide to race professionally. I mean, you know, you, you with your mom and your dad, I, I mean, I respected so much how you guys worked as a family unit and you grew up around it. But there was a moment, I think, right? Or a time, something. So could you share, a, how did that happen? Uh, well, I started racing when I was four and a half, five years old. So um, my mom and dad met racing go-karts. Um, my mom beat my dad. <laughs> <laughs> so I say I get my driving ability from my mom, not my dad. Uh, my dad is a mechanical engineer from, I don't throw anything, Ohio State University. <laughs> my mom is also a, um, she was a, a shop teacher um, from Ohio State University. Um, so between the teacher and the engineer, I grew up with a kind of a different mindset um, around race cars. Our family um, did a lot of the sprint cars with wings on dirt. If you're in Indiana, that's sh you know, shunned, but <laughs> wings are more popular in uh, Ohio and, and Pennsylvania. Um, but I did that for several years and it was just about fun. It really wasn't about a career because my dad taught me um, about cars and why they, why they go fast, how to make them faster, what's the car doing, how to give feedback so that you can get the car to do what you need it to do to be faster and, you know, win races. So that's what our lives were all about. My, my uncle built engines, still does for a lot of the World Outlaw guys. So, you know, engine technology and learning about how to run the valves in a short block Chevy, you know, one eight four three six five seven two. I can go do it right now. But <laughs> it was about family and it was about having fun with a sport and learning um, at the same time. So I grew up with that whole STEM world of math and science and understanding that what I was driving, I could make it better regardless of being a girl because I was smarter. <laughs> and they can't take that away from you. Um, I really didn't look at it as a career <clears throat> until I got the phone call. I got a phone call when I was um, probably 16 or 17 to do some stock car racing and I just really didn't like that. I don't know. Um, I was having fun with my family racing sprint cars, so I sort of passed on that. I got a call probably two months later <laughs> to go and take my IndyCar rookie test, um, and that kind of just sealed the deal. <laughs> Who was that call from? Uh, Dale Pelfrey. 
Dale Pelfrey, um, he, he still owns some of the uh, smaller teams, you know, the Road to Indy, and, and uh, so I see him here or there. Um, but really, uh, Derek Walker was the one that kind of got behind my first career days. So that's, I mean, t I find that interesting in the sense that somebody seeks you out as opposed, because you know often you've been around the sport long enough to know that it's usually the other way around. Drivers are chasing deals as opposed to somebody calling. So um, I, I'd like to pursue that at another time. Um, <laughs> I want to know that. Um, you have successfully transferred from you know, going through being a driver, being a team, you know, team owner. I mean, I, I think that was, I'm not going to put words in your mouth, maybe a little more necessity than, than, than intent of wanting to do that. But you have really expanded um, from the cockpit to the business. And so can you share with us, because I know that business also has a lot to do with the future generation coming up because of your, so would you talk about your business and the, the, the young people that you are seeing come through the, the karting that your programs are? So I'll have to point out first that you, both you and uh, Ms. Janet Guthrie were at my announcement in Homestead when I started the team and starting my own That race, was a special moment. Yes, that yes. was, the, I love that picture. That's, that's, that, <laughs> I'll remember that one for life. Where's Cindy at? <laughs> um, building the race team wasn't, um, it wasn't about money. Um, it wasn't about the um, business side of racing. It was because I got pissed off. <laughs> <laughs> I had a couple engineers uh, who I drove for uh, under a team owner that I still really respect, and they were chauvinistic. They didn't like me. Uh, they did not want me to succeed. They stacked cars against me. They put bad parts on the car for failure. Um, it almost hurt me at Michigan, and so I got upset because, you know, I went to my car owner, and I, I made a list. I was very prepared, even at... Um, you know, 26 years old at the time, and said, this is why it's not working for me. We need to make a change. And these people were so um, manipulative that it just, there was no change to be made. So I decided that if I'm going to do well, I'm going to control who works for me. <laughs> and that's kind of, you know, just a very bold statement to make. But I think it has such a broad coverage in, you know, trying to educate those around you to be um, to be thoughtful, to be good, to be to give your best, regardless of who it is that you're working with. Do the right thing. Do the right thing. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of what the team was founded over. And and then I have to point out my good friend Rick Dryling is over here. Rick Dryling. <clears throat> Rick uh, was the CEO at Dollar General, and um, we started the race team. Indianapolis, Marco and Tony Kanan got together and I got involved in it. So the car's in pieces. And <clears throat> I had only decided to run three events that first year that we started the team. And so by crashing this car <laughs> now, and I was up to third at one point and messed up, but that, whatever, um, here nor there, I was out for the season because I didn't have the money to repair the car. And Mr. Dryling gave me a call. I think it was uh, July and said, Ms. Fisher, how would you like to still run Kentucky and Chicago? Oh my God, I about fell out of my chair. <laughs> well, yes, sir, absolutely. So I came down here to, to Goodlettsville, where Dollar General is based, and had a meeting with him and his team. And then, um, I don't know, several years later, we won Dollar General, their first IndyCar race with Ed Carpenter. Um, and we were able to give Joseph Newgarden his first start in an IndyCar. So I owe a whole lot of... Um, my career and ownership to Mr. Dryling and his team. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rick. <laughs> and there's a lot of other men that we could thank, you know, for the, the ones that have helped us. Uh, but I also want to thank you for being so candid um, and sharing that. I mean, I think we don't like to talk about the bad shit, you know? We don't like to talk about that, but it's out there, it's happening, there's more types of stories, and, and but so thank you. I mean, because sometimes people gloss over that, you know? And 
but I want you to tell a little bit about your carding program, you know, your carding schools, because that's oh, okay. about the future, because that's the Driving kids. into the future, that's the panel, yeah, right. sorry. That's all right. No, 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 um, this, no, no, this was. Well, you started the, with why I started the team, so I, I had to really know. say we wanted why. To know. <laughs> I got married, and instead of having a baby, we blossomed an indie car team. <laughs> My parents thought we were nuts, you know, but hey, uh, 990, 500s later, I'm still nuts to them. So um, the carding really started because um, we were tr trying to bridge the gap of being team owners and having a business that actually made money. <laughs> you know, I, when I retired from driving, I, I had a little bit of a savings account, and then that all went away in the first year <laughs> of team owning. Um, you know, so it was kind of that bridge of gap of how can we make um, how can we make a difference in the community that we were in? Because I firmly believed that, believed that Indianapolis Motor Speedway uh, deserved to have an atmosphere around it, such as Charlotte or Daytona, um, because it's such, it, it has such history and it means so much just to me and my family uh, when we go there. So uh, the idea of starting an indoor karting facility uh, was a no-brainer because it would give us a way to connect with the community and to connect with kids and families who wanted to be in racing who otherwise had no idea how to get started. So I remember talking to you on the phone the other day about um, you know, kids that are off the street that aren't an Andretti, aren't a Foyt. Uh, I, I certainly wasn't one of those. Um, I was lucky because my family was already into racing. Um, but there's a lot of families and a lot of kids that visit us there in Speedway, Indiana, who, who are from St. Louis or, you know, they're from, I don't know, Tennessee here. And, and they're renting a go-kart and then you, they come several times because they enjoy it and they love uh, the thrill of it. And then I walk through the lobby and sometimes they know who I am, sometimes they don't. And sometimes when they don't, that's even more rewarding because I'll run into a dad like I did the day that we were on the phone and the dad says... I think, are you the owner here? And I said, uh, yes, sir. And he says, well, my kid, he's been here six or seven times now, and he just loves it so much. I'm, I'm just wondering, what's the next step? I said, oh, you are perfect. I said, <laughs> my husband and I actually own a competition go-kart track that's uh, south of Indianapolis in Whiteland, uh, Indiana, and it's sort of the next step. So from here, you rent a cart to now you're going to purchase a cart to compete against other people more on a... Um, like a traveling soccer team or a traveling basketball team. He goes, there is such a thing? I said, oh my goodness, yes, because that's where 99% of the kids that are running at Indianapolis started. You started in carts, I started in carts, uh, Joseph started in carts, Ed started in carts and quarter midgets. So, um, you know, having that gap filled in Indianapolis is just one location, but it, it is definitely very rewarding to work with parents and kids who otherwise have no identity within the sport to be able to give them an opportunity to, to start and see if they like it first without spending thousands and thousands of dollars and then be able to take them to a facility that isn't totally top tier that they can, you know, find a used go-kart, find a used engine, see if they like the competition side. And then from there, they just keep growing. And it's nice to be on site to be able to help those type of people. Very cool, very cool. Thank you. <clears throat> so talking about those kids, but not always just kids, uh, I want to talk to Jessica Fickinger. Um, Jessica is, works for SMI Speedway Motorsports Inc. and um, is one of her jobs, not many, uh, she has many, I know, but one of them is to work with the U.S. Legends um, and the Bandoleros um, and the INEX series. And so I want to ask you, because I know it's not just kids, but I know there's a lot of females and a lot of young people that come through, that you know, you've been working at the grassroots level of motorsports for a long time. Um, what, tell us about these legends and you know, about the cars. I mean, I think that alone is a good starting point. I don't, we don't have photos, I don't think, but I think it's good to kind of put a, ref, a point of reference about the sure. vehicles. Yeah. Yep, so um, the U.S. Legends Cars program is mainly, uh, we have Bandoleros and Legends Cars. So we have kids that kind of, some come up from karting, um, and we start as early as eight years old, and we have some drivers that are 88 years old. So it's a it's a great feeder program, but it's also a great um, program if you're a, a hobbyist and you just like to race. You don't want to go buy a big yacht and go fishing, you know. So you buy a race car and you go all over the country racing your car. So 
Um, it started in the um, in the mid 90s. Um, it was an idea that um, Bruton Smith and Humpy Wheeler had. It was kind of their brainchild. And how do we get? Um, it was really focused on how do we get kids involved. What's the Pop Warner of racing? So. Charlotte being the hub for NASCAR, we thought, you know, they thought it was a great idea to start it there. And now we have uh, races all, not just all over the country, we're all, we're all over the world. I actually had a, a call from a, a dealer that we have in Australia today about when his cars were going to get there. So um, it's, it's been a great program. I think it's, it's definitely a level playing field for sure. So you're all, it's based on your, your skills. So when your helmet's on, it's not, not a girl, not a boy, it's, it's the driver. I think uh, I, I fell in love when I started going over there with the fact that it's very family oriented. You see the families in the garage. You see um, the confidence that these kids have when they're talking to each other. And you know these these girls that we have that come up through it. They're they're just, they're phenomenal. They're they're whatever they want to do in life. I think they just really get confidence from from being a, a driver. And I know you guys could speak to that more than I can. But it's just fun to see that from the outside. And um, also from the boys' perspective, it teaches them at a really early age that girls can do anything along with them. So, and I, I really love that plants a seed early. That is a side benefit I think a lot of people overlook. I know we did a market research program online a number of years ago, and one of the you know comments that were made was that young boys learn how to respect females, you know, growing up all along because now they're getting beat by them. I mean, yep. so, yeah, I mean, it's sort of a side benefit. It isn't just girls get the confidence, but boys learn how to, you know, oh. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> how many, can you give me a rough idea, though? I mean, 10%, 50%, what do you think are females that actually kind of come through? Um, I probably would say maybe like 20 to 30%, um, which is pretty high, um, I, I think, in racing. So it's, it's a great... Um, I, I think it's a great number. We need to grow it, though. I want to see it to be, you know, 70 percent. So, um, you know, that's one of the the things that, you know, I, I've been with the company for a long time. I started out there when I was 19 years old. So, I mean, I've been there over 20 years. U.S. Legends is still kind of new for me. I just took on a leadership role there two or three years ago. So, you know, that's definitely one of my goals is to grow it um, from the, the female aspect. So. So, but the INEX series is different. So tell us about the So INEX is the sanctioning body. Oh. So U.S. Legends cars are the cars, and INEX is the sanctioning body. I got it. Yep. And you are all over the world with that. Correct. Yes, yes. Okay, we, we have thousands of races a year, and we have hundreds of members across the country, or across the world, actually. Cool, cool. So that, to me, is one of the, um, the entry points and the access points, because if we don't have access, then we don't we have nowhere to go, you know, and um, and so I think that is a very uh, important piece of this puzzle, because go karting has been around forever, and go kart was the common way. Um, by the way, Sarah, I used to run my go kart. I mean, I didn't start in go karts because I I did it all wrong, but in in between indie races, which was of course once a year for me for quite a while, I'd go out to Whiteland with my go kart track with my go kart just to be able to do laps. So the value of that. Um, I want to ask each of you for a final, somebody give you a chance to think about this, but for your final, you know, what is the future? What can we do differently? What can we do better? You can take this in any way you want um, to make the future brighter, to create the change that's needed. So um, I'm going to start, I, I mean, I, it's a little bit unfair with you because you're, but yet it's not because, you know, your play, to me, it's the play and the sports aspect, even though maybe motorsports hasn't been necessary because motorsports is hard. Even though we could, actually I remember I did a program and I got a um, soapbox derby. I, I donated a soapbox derby car to a program. That's my dream. Oh, I want, well, we, I want to okay. train girls to build cars and race them. Okay. I will make the commitment. I will make the commitment to get you a soapbox derby car that the girls... It's and, done. And, and then I have to get somebody with the local that can help be like the mentor to be help, how to build them. Because I did this once and it was absolutely fabulous to watch. Well, guess what? We just got a grant from GM. Okay. Cool. So, so we've fixed that. All right. Now, <laughs> I'm going to... No, I'm gonna, we got something solved. I love it. Okay. Sabra, um, what... What would you tell your 18-year-old self now that you've had the experiences you've had? So many things. <laughs> <laughs> um, Just share a few with us, you know? Um, I guess for me, it's all about, the biggest thing that I've learned is 
you get to choose your perspective every day. And you know, no one, you can't let other things affect that and you, it's a choice. Your, your perspective is basically your biggest tool because it can either be your power or it's your prison. And if we look at things like, oh, it's hard to do things as a female, it's this, it's that, and we always think of it negatively, if we look at it in more of a positive way and just think about excited that we're, you know, we have this challenge ahead of us and excited to work together in order to keep going forward, I think that is a, is a good mindset to, to carry on. And the most important thing, I think, is setting examples for those coming up, which is hopefully what we're doing here. <laughs> Thank you. Excellent. Okay. Sarah. <laughs> I've been thinking about it. Um, I think most importantly, it's about the bottom line of um, your success rate, right? So when I got the call, I had won like five out of 23 USAC midget events on pavement. And I was, I was successful, I was doing a good job. Um, I wasn't just out there doing. So I think for those um, girls and, and boys that we get to invite um, to, to be a part of our you know, carts to cars and, and that sort of drive that we have, starting in Indianapolis is about the bottom line and being successful and, and empowering them and giving them the opportunity to be on track and, and run up front. So focusing with the positive attitude and pressure, but it's, you've got to win. You've got to really have the success if you're going to get somewhere. That's a hard thing for, for somebody who's passionate and is trying really hard. It's a hard thing for them to hear, but that's what they need to hear is what you're saying. I'm Pretty much. Trying, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Jessica. Um, gosh, I would say um, ask questions, listen, um, don't turn down opportunities because you're scared. Take that, that leap of faith um, and, and trust your gut and your heart. I mean, usually those are your, your best instincts. So, you know, I, I, I've been pulling into the same parking lot. Our corporate offices are at Charlotte Motor Speedway since I was 19 years old, so almost 25 years. And I, there's days where I still get butterflies in my stomach when I go to work. So be, be passionate about what you do and, and stay true to yourself. Thank you. One sort of common thread, though, that I've just heard that I, I made note of is that there's too much that's still the same for change to happen, for the future to be brighter or change. Is there still too much the same? And the other is the importance of parents. Um, you know, it, it, I used to love it because it was about dads and daughters, um, because there aren't many things that dads can do with their daughters as their daughters grow up. Um, it can be moms as well. Um, but the, the, and I have found this through my own driver development program that parent, you know, if, when you're still living at home, you eat what your parents feed you in most cases. I mean, they still have the greatest influencers. And I think sometimes we, we either lose sight of that, we miss that, and it's the hardest thing because parents are going to raise their kids the way the way either they were raised or the way they think. And when you're trying to make change, how, you know, it's one thing to impact young people, but how can we also include the communication to the parents? So that's kind of my takeaway of you know, listening to all your stories. So I think the future's bright. Um, and I want to thank you all for, for you know, coming up and sharing your journey and sharing your stories. And I, and I hope that it has some benefit to the way you all are kind of thinking about what changes you can make to be able to kind of change the, change the future. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Well, Lynn, as we start to reset up here on stage, uh, a question to you, though, as, as such a defender of the next generation, what does the future, your perfect future, what does that look like to you? Well, I've been asked that, um, you know, is the goal, when, when I'm challenging people to come in and join, you know, what, we're, what I've been doing for all these decades, well, Lynn, what do you want? Do you want 50-50? Are we trying to get... No, 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 no. It's not a numbers game for, for me. It, it's about opportunity, and it's about preparing the ones that are there um, for more success. What, what tools do they need to be more successful? And then it's about preparing or helping educate the decision makers about what they need to do. It's like, to me, it's a... There's like two ends of this story or this tool that we got to get the, the teachers, the track promoters, the 
coaches, I mean, all those people, we got to get them to understand how to communicate with women, young girls, with, you know, and then we got to get, on the other side, we got to get the young people kind of prepared for what this sport is really all about. But I see that what I love to see is the numbers. It's about increasing the numbers and they're seeing that happen. There's more go-carters, there's more young people competing, young females competing. Part of that I do think is as a result of Title IX. We now have moms and dads who have gone to college and took sports and they see that. You've heard the statistics about women that are in the C-suite and how they had sports. So they're now saying it's okay for our daughters to do what's almost always was okay for our boys to do. So, um, so I, I'm very optimistic about the fact that, but at the same time, I'm very frustrated because it's coming slow, that's all. I mean, I just think there's too many things we don't know. And, and there, that's, so that's my summary about the future's bright, but this is why these types of programs are important because if you care and now you have the access and the benefit to hear from a Sarah Fisher, to hear from a young driver who's trying to make a career, and you know, they, you'll be better prepared when you go back to your life to know how to give somebody advice or how to maybe change or modify how you communicate or how you do business, so. Well, there's no doubt about it. We know that you care, so thank you for being <laughs> well, such a Well, we all need to it. care. No, 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 we all need to care. We all need to care.